Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Ministers and diplomats from all over the world are meeting in Madrid for a two-week summit on how to tackle climate change. The head of the UN, Antonio Guterres, has warned that the point of no return on climate change is in sight and hurtling towards us. The leaders of small island countries, among the most vulnerable to rising seas, have appealed for help. From Madrid, our science editor David Shukman reports. Driving rain and powerful winds as the latest typhoon approaches the Philippines. With plenty of early warning, families are helped to safety. It's the poorest that are least able to cope, and as global temperatures rise, it's likely storms will become even more dangerous in future. The people of the Bahamas experienced that for themselves earlier this year. Hurricane Dorian caused death and devastation on an unimaginable scale. And developing countries say that because it's the richest nations that caused climate change, they should now help. It gives me great pleasure to declare open this 25th session. So here in Madrid, as the annual UN talks on climate change get underway, one of the loudest demands is from the countries most vulnerable to those bigger storms. We worry about our livelihoods. We worry about the future generations. We worry about our country. We, we exist as people. We in the small islands, we exist as people. We have our cultures, we have our families, we have our livelihoods, and we face extinction. You can't get away from that. And it's, it's not a nice thought, it's scary. All the time, the gases that are heating up the atmosphere are still being pumped out, and in ever greater quantities, increasing the risks of damaging impacts, and despite all the scientific warnings that this should stop. There's been frantic diplomacy on climate change over the past quarter of a century, with huge gatherings like this one. But the source of the problem remains unchecked. All the more reason, the head of the UN tells me, to help those most in danger. Because whether people like to admit it or not, climate change is already a problem today. And we are having terrible impacts in drought, in uh, uh, floods, uh, in other kinds of natural, in hurricanes, uh, uh, in countries that are already suffering enormously. The whole issue of how much help to provide and who's to blame for the rise in temperatures has become incredibly contentious among the different teams here, and it won't be easy to settle. And another reminder of what's at stake as the negotiations begin. Severe flooding in Kenya in the last few days, amid the fear that without the right global response, there'll be much worse to come. David Truckman, BBC News in Madrid. The climate crisis could soon reach the point of no return, United Nations Chief Antonio Guterres has warned, describing the global response so far as utterly inadequate. Delegates from almost 200 countries are in Madrid for the two-week UN climate conference, intended to set out the next phase of action to tackle global warming. And the sense of urgency could not be more critical. Our chief correspondent, Alex Thompson, is in Madrid. Alex. Yes, well, it depends where you put your money and your faith, John. I think COP, the COP, stands for the Conference of Parties. Do you believe the 25 years of failure and make your judgment or the two weeks to get it right, as the UN Secretary General said today? There are some hopeful signs, important to note them. Recently, the EIB, the European Investment Bank, said no more investment in fossil fuels. It's one of the biggest banks in the world. After one year, frees up a trillion, yes, a trillion dollars for reinvestment in renewable energies across Europe. And today, a reminder. Remarkable letter signed by CEOs and labor unions in the United States. Google, Apple, Apple Total, Shell, PepsiCo, the Coca-Cola company, you name it, all saying America has to stay in the Paris Agreement, even though Donald Trump, of course, wants out, and of course, he's not here. COP25, meaning 25 years of moving global warming from a distant notion to an impending catastrophe. Thus, a monumental failure by every country on earth, ununited nations under the umbrella of the United Nations. We are confronted now with a global climate crisis. And the point of no return is no longer over the horizon. It is in sight and hurtling towards us. In the Netherlands, we invest billions of euros in adapting our country to the changing climate. The state we're in means heads of state pondering losing the states they head. 
So the writing is on the wall. There are slogans here, hot air, rhetoric. Oh yes, world leaders are strong on that. I mean, for Netherlands, this is an existential question. Absolutely. Your country might not exist. Six or seven million people living below sea level. So for us, building dikes, fighting climate change, but also to adapt to it is crucial. Of course, with President Trump not coming, talking of pulling out of the Paris Accord altogether, that's one hell of a signal to the humanity, isn't it? Well, we have our own signal as in the positive way to have uh, 15 members here from the Congress, the House and the Senate uh, to w make a commitment as well as to listen to how we all can w do better working together. Are you Thank saying, you. in effect, yeah. don't worry about the White House, America is listening? Um, oh, we're in it. We're still in it. America is still in it, yes. But ask them about real action, and they run for the hills. Stopping subsidies for fossil fuels? Step by step. OK. <laughs> People talk about ending subsidies to the fossil fuel business full stop globally. Don't we need some action like that? Well, we need to do, we have to be on the positive side of things. The reality is in our country that would be hard to do now, although we've been trying to do it for a while. Almost 30,000 delegates and visitors, 50 heads of state over two weeks to act towards keeping global warming this side of a point of no return, desperately trying to salvage the broken global promises that came out of the Paris Agreement four years ago. With zero irony, delegates here can eat at Burger King, meat production being, of course, a leading greenhouse gas producer. Endesa, the power giant and Spain's largest CO2 emitter, is sponsoring this conference. Yet, without COP, the Paris Agreement on climate change would never have happened. And now, some demand that we move much further, much faster. I want Europe to become the first climate neutral continent in the world by 2050. The EU Commission President promising a new Green Deal in her first 100 days in office. But elsewhere, contrasting moves today. Wrong side of history or not, Chinese and Russian leaders signing a major new gas pipeline deal. The UK mission stand here in Madrid trumpets a green revolution, but our government back home still hides key information about fracking for shale gas from the public. The report is headed confidential and commercially sensitive. None of it to be released under the Freedom of Information Act. None of it may be shared within government or beyond. What is released was described by Greenpeace today as a wall of ink, almost all the report entirely censored. But why? What mustn't the public know from a report three years old into a business now opposed by all main parties except the Tories, and they've suspended it? Rebellion. Late this afternoon, Extinction Rebellion briefly blocked the road outside the conference centre. Likely to be a probing manoeuvre, testing the police response ahead of more concerted action. These protesters, like the UN Secretary General inside, frustrated, now frightened at the lack of action. Alex Thompson, Channel 4 News, Madrid. Now, the UN Secretary General has warned politicians meeting in Madrid for climate change talks that the world is approaching the point of no return. The COP25 summit will see 29,000 people attending over the next two weeks with the aim of securing even stricter limits on emissions than those agreed in Paris in 2015. But four years on from that admittedly groundbreaking deal, there is increasing concern it simply doesn't go far enough. As we've reported in our series, Earth on the Edge, the effects of climate change are already being felt in Zimbabwe. Uh, the country was once seen as the breadbasket of Africa, but the rains have repeatedly failed, and the country is now facing the worst drought in 35 years. It means that instead of exporting food to its neighbours, Zimbabwe is now relying on handouts to feed millions of its own people. Mile upon mile of rural Zimbabwe is now without crops, without livestock, without water. Like most of southern Africa, climate change here has parched the land and brought millions to the brink of starvation. This land that was once the breadbasket of southern Africa is now barren, and everyone trying to live off it is hungry, very hungry. 
Eight million people here are now dependent on food from the UN, some of which originates from Britain. The rollout of international aid is one of the most ambitious feeding programs in UN history. This scene is being replicated all over rural Zimbabwe. Rising temperatures and less rainfall means the so-called hunger gap, when their homegrown food runs out, is hitting earlier and earlier and harder and harder. That leaves only two options, queue for food aid or starve. I don't have seeds. You have nothing. I have nothing. Emma Malumi has watched three harvests fail on her once fertile land. A widow, she is now only able to feed her family one small meal a day. We pray to God that God should give us water, otherwise we can survive because we are starving. The drought also means thousands of cattle and donkeys have died. Many of those still standing are near collapse. What little water there is, is being saved to help keep the people alive. And the food urgently needed is being imported by the ton, ready to help millions who the UN says are marching towards starvation. We're talking about communities disintegrating, people's lives are at risk. We all know that it started off with the climate change, the impact of drought. But this has now been compounded by the economic challenges that we are facing. Those challenges now mean that hunger is a daily reality for children in the towns. Mothers like Zizi and Zubaya grow what they can in the drought. Runaway inflation has made the food that has to be imported unaffordable. <laughs> Rukudzo's 14 out of school and living on one bowl of porridge each day. My Zimbabwe is descending into crisis. Climate change and economic collapse have combined to leave a nation that once could feed itself, now totally dependent on foreign aid to help its citizens survive. Penny Marshall, News at 10, Zimbabwe. And Tom is here, of course. We've talked about the subject uh, an awful lot, but just set the scene for this summit, if you would. It's the major international summit that they have every few years to try and you know, get agreement on climate change. Paris was only the beginning of that process. I think it's fair to say, although it was a momentous agreement, Madrid, it's going to be all about massively upping the commitment from countries. Because as things stand, mm. we're on trend for more than three degrees of global warming by the end of this century, which would be disastrous for humanity as it currently functions and for millennia to come. Massive sea level rise, extreme weather, you name it. Even if everyone hits their Paris pledges, we're still looking at 2.9 degrees of global warming. Remember, it was all set up to keep it below mm. one and a half degrees of warming. Mm. Huge amount of, 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 of commitment lacking, but also interesting details that could derail the whole process. Highlighted really in, in that report there, how do you compensate poor countries for the damage our pollution has caused them? One of the agreements made at Paris that still hasn't been finalised. OK, we've been reported so often about the effects in the Solomon Islands, in Greenland, in Madagascar. I mean, do you think the leaders really get the seriousness? I, I'm of the opinion now that they do get it. They would not have signed that agreement if they didn't. But what you've got here is 195 countries being asked to agree such a complex agreement that involves ultimately the exchange of economic wealth and money. How are you going to do that? There's an expectation it will lag behind uh, the climate change process. We're hoping ambitious countries like ours will help lead it. Either way, OK. Thank you very much, Tom, indeed. I've been